Okay, so now we're going to change things completely and talk about pests. So everything, insects, bugs, all the, and all the issues associated. Um, so first, I'm just going to sort of introduce myself, uh, what I do at HTCA. Um, so I look after all the different pest projects, and I also tend to get involved with different pesticide legislation issues. As I'm sure you're aware, um, a lot of the pest control products um, have been coming under a lot of pressure from the sort of EU legislation, for example, Munich restrictions, um, methiocarb, which we recently lost, and also, um, for example, um, dimethoate and the use of dead heart sprays in, uh, for wheat bulb flies. So it's just a couple of examples. Um, I also am one of the basis qualified people at HTCA. Um, I'm a farmer's daughter, and I also did agriculture at university. It's quite a diverse sort of agricultural background. Um, so before I get started, I want everybody to actually put their handouts on the floor or away from them, so they don't cheat. <laughs> Just for the first few slides. <laughs> Um, okay, so first of all, I'm going to ask you about some of the issues sort of ongoing with pest control. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the research we've got ongoing with different pests, um, in particular some of the monitoring and threshold and why they're so important and where you can find the different information on those. So first of all, can anyone think of some of the major issues we have perhaps sort of affecting the control of certain pests. Yep, so yeah, resistance is one of the main issues we've got. So um, where people are sort of applying them again and again, you tend to get sort of resistance developing in some of your major pests, for example, aphids. Um, any other major issues? Yep, so legislation. So yeah, product withdrawal, um, restrictions and bans. Um, for example, the Munich and a couple of others that I mentioned earlier, and then the lack of options we've got. So we've got sort of tighter restrictions being enforced, um, but nothing new is really being added to, to um, the toolbox. So there's sort of issues being tied in there. So um, anything else anyone can think of? Perhaps affects why pests become sort of more in certain times of the year. Different. Yep. Yeah, climate change, weather. So a lot of pest outbreaks are dictated um, by what's going on with the weather. Um, for example, if you have really wet autumn, you might get um, significant outbreaks of slugs. Or this year we had a really dry September, um, which was very favorable for the cabbage stem flea beetle. Um, so anything else anyone can think of? I'll check my next one. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the tricky one. So th this is so rotation really affects what pests there are as well. Um, so the tighter rotations is tending to affect um, what pests they are and also making them um, more prominent. And then we've got the three crop wool coming in. And an example of where you can affect different pests is where you're getting um, blocks of crops. So for example, um, blocks of fields of all seed rape can affect um, pests, for example, um, pollen beetle. And then the last one, um, I, the reason I put issues in italic is because the last one is what's affecting us, but we shouldn't really call it an issue as such. Um, and that's protecting beneficials, which is really important to do and to consider those um, when you're thinking about crop protection. Um, but of course, they do in then also enforce restrictions on controlling the pests. Um, so an example could be um, chlorpyrifos and the restrictions enforced in the, the use of that, the voluntary initiative, um, for example, the, the Say No to Drift campaign. Um, so to get you thinking about different pests throughout the year, um, I just want you to think about what pests will be you'll be thinking of from drilling all the way through to sort of harvest time. So yeah, what pest will you be thinking about first in cereals? Yep, slugs, hang on. <laughs> yes, it's slugs, yeah, the first one you're thinking about, so seed hollowing, leaf shredding. Um, next pest. 
Uh, you probably get it more after um, having grass in the rotation. Yep. So leather jackets and wire worm, you'll be looking for, yeah, particularly after grass rotations. Um, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we'll get to that one in a minute. <laughs> I haven't got them all here, which is why I put key pests in brackets, because otherwise we'd just be here all week. Um, yeah, so the next one you'll be thinking of, probably at the moment, and virus. Yep, so aphids, so bird chariot aphid and grain aphid, and um, their importance in spread of barley yellow dwarf virus. And then next one, which... Yep, so yep, fruit fly, again. Um, so one of the reasons this one can be quite important for some farmers, maybe not so important for others, is it can have up to three generations a year, um, so it can affect the crop um, at different times. Um, next one, another sort of more minor pest, yeah, gout fly. So this is where you see sort of plump um, plants sort of later on in the year. Next one, or two. Both have the same symptoms. Yep, yep. So wheat bulb fly, yellow cereal fly, where you tend to see um, dead hearts. Um, yellow cereal fly, you tend to get the ring around the bottom of the plant, and that's tends to be the main way you can tell that apart. Um, wheat bulb fly tends to be more significant because of where it moves from tiller to tiller and can cause um, more significant damage. Um, next one tend to get around early June. Yep, orange root blossom midge. We've heard quite a bit already about orange root blossom midge and resistance, and not resistance, sorry, ver well, varietal resistance. Um, and I'll touch on that one a bit later. And then last thing you might see perhaps at when your ears are out, colonizing the ear. Yep, yep, so back to aphids. Yeah, so grain aphid you tend to see on the leaves and rose grain aphid tends to colonize, um, colonize the ears more. So which do you think of these does HCCA provide information on? Yep, trick question, all of them. Um, which, do you think, uh, which do you think we have current research on? It's not all of them, unfortunately. <laughs> Aphids, yeah. Well, yeah, well, um, wheat bulb fly, we've got the wheat bulb fly survey, so I will talk on that a little bit later. And yeah, so we've got a lot of research ongoing on aphids. And you mentioned slugs. We've had research on slugs in the past, and we're hoping to fund some more research on slugs next year. Um, then we've also done research on some of the other pests there in the past. Okay, so now we're going to do the same for all seed rape pests. So the first one you're thinking of, quite topical this year. Yep, cabbage stem flea beetle. So we actually tried to get an idea of the damage this year. Um, so we did a snapshot um, survey looking at the damage at the end of September. And nationally, was, it was around about um, total crop losses of around about 3%. Um, but it, we also found it was quite regional. So in certain counties, for example, Surrey and Hampshire, um, they had nearly 50% crop loss. So really significant in some areas. Next pests. Yep, slugs, heard that somewhere. Um, next one. Not quite. Something which tends to look bad, but is not such an issue. Yep. Yeah, so leaf blotch minor. Um, yeah, farmers sometimes get a little bit worried about it because it can look bad, but um, the leaves tend to die back anyway, so it's unusual for it to really be significant. Next one you're looking at at the moment, thinking about spraying potentially. Yeah, so peach potato aphids and the transmission of turnip yellows virus. Next one. Only one group's got this one so far. It's a less common one. Nope. Yep, yep, 
Hold on. So yeah, great winter stone weevil. Um, so we haven't really seen a really significant outbreak of this since the 80s, but where um, farmers do tend to see it is um, near woodland, so that's where you might get it. Um, next one, roundabout buzz stage. Yeah, pollen beetle. Also tends to look a lot worse than it is. In most years, you don't actually, you wouldn't actually need to spray for it. Um, but this is one of those pests which does tend to get, unfortunately, oversprayed. But I will touch on that later. Um, next one or two immediately after. Yep, yep, I heard someone over there. So yeah, cabbage seed weevil and brassica pod midge. Um, so it's the, the pod midge which tends to do the damage, um, but the midge lays its egg in the exit hole of the weevil larvae, so tend to think of these together. And then the last one, which you tend to see on the edge of the crop on the pods, can make the tips go purple in stress. Yeah, aphids again. So yeah, mealy cabbage aphids. So yeah, another one which farmers tend to see on the edge of the crop. Um, but once you go in, um, sometimes you'll find it isn't actually as big a problem as it might look. So which do we provide information on? All yeah, all of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about current research ongoing at the moment? Well done. <laughs> so they're the ones which we've got ongoing research at the moment. Um, got a lot of work on aphids, so this ties in with the work we've got with cereals. Um, pollen beetle looking at thresholds, and then the cabbage stem flea beetle work, some of which we talked about where we looked at um, the damage this year. Um, but research we've had on the past, um, the relationship with the seed weevil and the pod midge, and then slugs, which I also talked about with the cereals. Um, so which pests do you think we should monitor for? Yeah, yeah, trick question, another one. All of them. Yeah, should be looking for all of them. Um, never make a spray decision based on what your colleague has done or the farmer's neighbour. You should, every farm's different. You should always go out and actually look what's there using monitoring tools and thresholds, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And now you can look at your handouts again, if you haven't already picked them up. <laughs> Okay, so one of the main reasons that you need to be monitoring them and using these thresholds is because it forms part of your integrated pest management, um, which comes under the Sustainable Use Directive. Um, so yeah, it's really important. I'll touch a bit more on that later when I come to talk more specifically about um, pest thresholds. So why the hell do you have to monitor them all? Well, oh, what do you have to monitor them all, sorry? Um, well, luckily, there's lots of different um, tools and surveys and um, information which can help you do this monitoring, um, so you don't have to rely solely on just spending every single day looking at every field. Um, so you've got different online monitoring tools, incident surveys like the wheat bulb fly survey I mentioned, um, e-newsletters, um, good old crop walking and trapping, which some people forget that there are different trapping techniques you can do to see when the pests are coming in. Um, for example, water traps, sticky traps, and um, pheromone traps as well. So first, I'm going to talk about pollen beetle monitoring. So HTCA funded a project where part of it, we looked at a forecasting tool, uh, which is used across Europe and this was called ProPlant, and it was based on temperatures. Um, so the optimum time for pollen beetle to migrate is around about 15 degrees C. Uh, so it's looking at those weather conditions and trying to um, bring about a sort of traffic-like system. So this is used a lot in Europe. And we found out that this would actually work and could be applied in the UK. Since that project has ended, the tool has been adopted by Bayer. Um, but you can access it through our, web our pest webpage. 
So it can give you an indication of the start of migration, um, any new migrations, and also the end of migration. But it's also really important to um, check the crop as well. So when there is high levels of migration, don't solely rely on it. Um, every field is different. And also you've got that risk of if it's gone past the bud stage and it started flowering, it's no longer a pest, it then becomes your beneficial um, and becomes a pollinator. So don't, you shouldn't apply a spray if it's, <coughs> if it's then started flowering. Um, I should have said at the start, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Is everyone good on the pollen beetle at all? Good? Okay, so next one is the wheat bulb fly survey. So this is done through testing soil cores for the eggs of the wheat bulb fly. So there are 30 sites across the UK, 15 in the north and 15 in the east. And after egg laying in about August, they do soil cores in sites where they're high risk. So after crops where there's been bare ground, for example, peas um, and potatoes, and they will look at the number of eggs and then apply that to a risk level. So the highest risk is if there's more than 250 eggs per meter squared. And because it's so tight, so the egg laying is August, um, then we've got the soil sampling and testing in September. And obviously you're already then thinking, do I need to put a seed treatment on for wheat bulb fly? Or what do I need to be thinking about for um, the new year when egg hatch? Um, so we tweet the information as it comes through, so as they're doing that sampling and assessment in the lab, and then the report itself comes out um, at the end of September. So this is the results from this year, so the different crops that they looked at. So the highest risk was after vining peas, and seed potatoes was also one of the high risk crops, and last year's seed potatoes was also the highest. So yeah, that can help you um, then use this information um, by deciding and looking at the thresholds. So if you can look at the, um, the drilling date of the wheat and match it up with um, the egg numbers in the different situations, you can then it can help you make a decision on whether or not to apply seed treatment or to apply um, egg hatch spray for pyrifos. Next one I'm going to talk about is the AFID News. So this is a weekly e-newsletter um, which comes out each Friday and it brings together information from 15 suction traps across the UK which are basically giant upside down hoovers which suck everything out of the sky, so all the aphids which are flying over. <coughs> And then they're all assessed back at Rothamsted, so they can see different types of aphids. So it can give you a really good idea of what um, different aphid species are migrating in what regions, and also when that migration was taking place. And then at other times of the year, we've also brought in information from the other crop sectors. Um, so we've got the yellow water traps, which is part of Potato Council, and then also information from a horticulture, and PGRO and BBRO as well. So we're all trying to bring as much aphid information together to help people know when to time those sprays. It's also really useful as a warning for virus. Um, so the last sort of really bad BYDV turnip yellows virus outbreak was 2011-12 year. Um, I don't remember, you remember seeing a lot of sort of yellow patches in the fields um, the following spring. Well, that year, we actually extended the alerts because of the mild conditions, and those people who had been receiving the newsletters would have had those warnings um, informing them that there was a high, very high risk of virus transmission. Um, unfortunately, what a lot of people did is applied the insecticides too early, so the insecticide sprays wouldn't have targeted the aphids, which migrated at a later date in that particular year. So that's one of the key reasons why this is so important. Another piece of work we do to do with aphids is aphid resistance work. I've just brought out one example here, which is looking at um, the peach potato aphid. And so this has been looking at, this particular work is looking at um, mace resistance to pyrimicarb, 
and then KDR to pyrethroids. Um, so we try and keep um, tabs on the situation, see if there's any new developments. Um, and a particular development we had with the peach potato aphid is where it looked as though the KDR resistance was in decline. Um, but when they looked closer at the aphids and looked at the mutation again, they found that what had happened is that it had actually developed a super KDR. Um, and since then, all the aphids that they've tested, so 100% of the tested samples, have had this resistance and mace as well. So it's unlikely that these insecticides will provide any control. This piece of work also looks at other insecticides too and to see where th whether there's any shifts in resistance. So for example, pyrimetrazine, linicamid, and neonix too, as you might be aware that there's um, peach potato aphid resistance to neonix in Europe. Um, so that's one thing that they're keep keeping a particularly close eye on. <coughs> Saddle gall midge, I think somebody might have mentioned that earlier. So this um, was quite an unusual pest until around about 2011 and 12 when some farmers had um, some quite severe outbreaks and significant yield losses. Um, it's usually found in continuous cereals or tight rotations and until recently was a major pest sort of back in the 70s. So we've got two pieces of research looking at this uh, one at Harper Adams and one at ADAS. And they've got six sites between them where they're monitoring the development of them. So the time that they invade the crop is at stem extension. So we provide information um, about the development and whether or not there's any kind of risk and also learning a bit more about the biology of the pest because it is such an unusual one. The E-newsletters, some people might not think of as a monitoring, a way of monitoring, but it's actually um, extremely useful because what they can do is where they come out monthly, they can prepare you for the month ahead. So they will indicate all the different um, pests, and it's not just pests, it's weeds and diseases as well, um, any sort of significant risks, um, and remind you of where to get that information. So it's almost like a trigger in your brain of what you need to be sort of looking for in the coming month, where you can get that information. And also warn you of any new is issues or any um, significantly new research um, results we've had come out, which would be published in that too. Pest specific, specific information. So we have um, information sheets, which you've heard of this morning too. So some examples are wheat bulb fly, cabbage stem flea beetle, and aphids, and the different viruses that they transmit. Um, so this is where there's been significant work on individual pests, and we've put that all into one information sheet. And then the new exci exciting publication we've got coming out is the new Pest and Natural Enemies Encyclopedia which we're hoping to launch at CropTech. Fingers crossed, everything goes well at the printers this week. So, and that is, if you've been familiar with the weed encyclopedia or the disease encyclopedia, it's gonna be quite similar to those, but also include information on natural enemies. So you don't um, get confused if you don't know what something is. And it also provides a lot of information on thresholds, um, and sort of brings together a lot of the most recent information on a, a huge number of pests. And then they all bring in together sort of different methods of trapping and thresholds. So you can use these whilst you're out doing your crop walking. Control thresholds. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of these, probably some of the most sort of questioned controversial ones. Um, and the main reason that these are really important is so you only spray when it is absolutely necessary. Um, and what some of the key reasons are this, again, integrated pest management. Um, a lot of the thresholds you do actually find on the product label too. So it comes under a condition of use. So it's, that becomes then a legal thing. Um, but there's a lot of other things you need to take into consideration too. Um, for example, the effects on biodiversity for example, um, beneficial insects like bees, 
um, aquatic life, protecting drinking water quality, and then also um, soil life as well. Resistance, I've also touched on. So if you're applying um, spray treatments unnecessary, you are increasing the risk of resistance developing. And some recent examples are where it's developed in pollen beetle, cabbage stem flea beetle, which we confirmed this year, and aphids, so grain aphid and peat potato aphid. Um, an example of where there may be a resistance where we don't even know it is in certain pests and why you have to be so careful is when we requested samples for cabbage stem flea beetles, somebody actually sent in a sample of striped flea beetle, which is more of a pest um, on vegetable crops or in spring rape. And they tested it anyway at Rothams did, and they did find that it too had developed resistance to pyrethroids. So it just demonstrated that it could be there even when you don't think it is there. So it's, it's another really important reason why you shouldn't spray unnecessarily. And then cost, obviously, with the cost of production, um, the cost of um, the prices of wheat at the moment is keep, seems to be getting lower and lower. So that unnecessary cost is another thing which you really don't want. So. HDCA's research tends to back up a lot of these control thresholds, so we review them um, from time to time to check that they're still really relevant, especially as if there's significant changes to the crop or the pest or control options. And some of the research often sets the thresholds. So I'm going to talk through some of them now, and I'm going to start with the pollen beetle control thresholds, which are some which tend to confuse a lot of people and the reason that they have changed recently is because the number of beetles that the crop can tolerate is um, directly correlated with the plant population so the best example I can think of is if you've got a lower plant population it's got more room for the plants to grow so you're going to end up with big sort of Christmas tree type plants with lots of um, pods on them. So if the beetles come in, it might get a, a few of them, but there's other ones which can sort of compensate for that loss. But where you've got a really high population and the plants are all sort of tightly packed, you might only have sort of a few seed heads. So when the beetles come in and get those heads, that could be that plant knocked out. So that's where those thresholds come in. Does that make sense to everybody? Good, I've got nods. So this is where these particular thresholds came from. I'm not going to read through every single one of them. The most sort of specific scientific way to work out the population is by counting the number of plants in a square foot and then multiplying by 11. Another way you can get an idea is simply getting on your hands and knees and looking through the bottom of the crop. So in a really thick crop, you're going to get a lot of really thin stems. So obviously, that's, you've got your really high population. Um, and you're going to get a lot of thicker stems and more space in um, your lower population crop. And what the farmer has drilled, the population might not necessarily be what he's told you either. So make sure you do have a look. Next one, cabbage stem flea beetle very topical. So these thresholds are the historic thresholds. We did alter them slightly this year, so they bring in the cotyledon stage, whereas before it was at the leaf stage, um, as it's as soon as the crop emerges, the beetles come in. Um, so it's a quarter of the leaf area at this particular stage, and then 50% um, at the three to four leaf stage, as as soon as the crop begins to leaf, it's a lot more able to tolerate the damage. The most important thing to remember is that if the crop is growing more slowly than the beetles are coming in and attacking it, which is what we saw in September. So where we had that particularly dry September this year, um, the crop which was drilled at that time had um, very little moisture, so it was very slow to emerge. So that unfortunately correlated coincided with the beetles coming in, which is where some people got quite significant crop.
crop losses. Unfortunately, we're not out of the woods yet with flea beetle because the next issue is the larvae as what some people forget is whilst the beetles were feeding amongst the leaves and causing that shot holing, they were also mating and laying their eggs at the base of the plants. And those larvae will have since um, moved into the leaf petioles where they'll then be feeding throughout the winter and then move into the leaf stem. So there's thresholds for those two. So if anyone had been using water trapping to monitor the beetles, a catch of more than 35 beetles um, would indicate a significant risk. And then if you were going to do the diception method, which you do around about now, end of October, early November, more than two larvae per plant or more than half of the PTL's damage would be um, where there's significant risk and you might consider a spray threshold. Is everyone happy with that? Yep. Okay. So moving on to the next one, orange root blossom midge. We, we've heard a, a bit about that this morning and varietal resistance. So when I looked on the recommended list yesterday, there's 18 of the 40 varieties now have orange root blossom midge resistance. Um, Skyfall was mentioned this morning. That's the variety which, the group one variety which has resistance. Unfortunately, they aren't, there aren't any group two varieties and most of the resistance falls into the group threes and fours. If the farmer is growing a resistant variety, then there's no need to think about spraying and therefore no need to think about the monitoring and thresholds of them. If they are growing a non-resistant variety, then this is where you need to refer to the thresholds. So some farmers, it tends to be um, a frequent occurrence or non-frequent occurrence. So they should know whether they're one of those farmers that is quite um, prone to it or not. They may have um, pheromone traps, which you can use to monitor and with the thresholds. But what a lot of people tend to rely on is the one midge on three years for feed crops or one midge on six years for milling and seed crops. <coughs> the last one I'm going to talk about in terms of thresholds is slugs. Um, slugs and metaldehyde have, have become particularly topical because of metaldehyde getting into watercourses. Um, so it's particularly important to monitor them and only put slug pellets down where there is that significant risk. So there are thresholds there, and they're four slugs per trap. And the traps, usually you put layers mash in, never put slug pellets in them. A lot of farmers might turn to you and say, I have no chickens, why on earth am I going to have some layers mash? You don't have to put layers mash in. So what you can do is basically use the trap as a, a refuge trap for the slugs. So if you put sheeting down, hold it down with some rocks, they then look the next day. It's highly likely that the, sl the slugs have um, remained under the sheet. This is similar how if you turn over a rock, you find them underneath. So that will give you an indication of the um, number of slugs and the level of risk. Get Pellet Wise is the metaldehyde stewardship campaign, which I hope everybody has heard of. Um, so this encourages people to only use it when absolutely necessary and consider, consider um, using ferric phosphate. You can also look, in, look on the What's in Your Backyard website, which can show um, where the areas are of the farm may fall into different zones. Um, so you can find out if the farm does lie in an area where they're um, near and a water extraction point. So I'm just about coming to the end. So hopefully I've explained how important monitoring and control is and how it's so essential is that part of IPM in terms of legislation, regulatory issues, protecting the beneficial I um, insects and also resistance and trying to keep hold of the insecticides that we do have. So we've got information on just about every pest you can think of. If you do come across a really unusual pest, which is 
eating a crop which you're looking after, don't hesitate to contact me. I'd love to try and find out what it was or find, try and find the information for you. I'd be happy to do that. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you.